Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Monday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Jim Garrity of National Review is back from the National Rifle Association annual meeting, and he'll have a few thoughts on that as we go along in today's podcast. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. And, Jim, we start with a good martini that actually uh, came out uh, towards the end of last week, and that was a poll conducted by the Washington Post, which has made the Washington Post and its writers very, very sad. And that's that 9 out of 10 Native Americans polled do not find the name Redskins disrespectful. So all those Democratic senators that uh, said that that had to change and the Redskins losing their trademark and and licensing rights from the Patent and Trademark Office, um, never mind. The interesting uh, argument they now have to shift from uh, Dan Steinberg, who, who, to his credit, writes a sports column that kind of says, look, you know, maybe both sides are wrong, which is a shift for the Post. <laughs> you know. But even then, his, his new, the new strategy is like, look, there's like 10 million Americans out there. So it means about a, well, about a million Americans do think it's disrespectful. So if you invite 10 friends to a dinner party and one leaves in tears, was the night a success? Um, I suppose that's one way of looking at it. Uh, another way is some people are going to be offended by anything you do. And this, this seems pretty definitive. It's hard to get 90% of a group of people to unify on anything. So, uh, you know, for those of us who've always thought it was kind of overstated, uh, I periodically like to float the idea of renaming them after Redskin Potatoes. Yes. Uh, and I like the idea of the giant potato mascot running around the field. Um, but uh, look, this this really should put it to bed because as he kind of acknowledges, for Mark Warner and Harry Reid and all these, you know, generally Democratic senators like, you know, like, do they, why, if, if Native Americans aren't bothered by it, why are you? <laughs> why are you telling Native Americans that they have to be, uh, uh, feel disrespected by this? Aren't they, they're, they're independent human beings who can make up their own mind. And if they choose, look, we got bigger problems to worry about than this team name, then maybe this is a giant waste of time and not something people should be spending much, uh, uh, effort and, and, you know, things fighting about it. It, it just seems like, you know, a, a, a real um, exaggeration of prioritizing people's feelings. And now we find out it's not even that many people's feelings. So ultimately, I think this is this is going to be a, a, a serious uh, uh, setback for the effort to get the team to rename itself. It indicates that political correctness uh, really is much more of a boutique issue and the sort of things that only, you know, diehard lefties and metropolitan cities where you spend a lot of time in newsrooms and groups like that. Average Americans just don't care. Um, my guess is Native Americans are more offended if uh, if the team is terrible. <laughs> they won the NFC East last year. They're feeling a little better about it lately. So, And also, i got to give credit. The Washington Post commissioned this poll. And you got to figure there must have been some people in that newsroom who did not want hide the results. Don't let anybody see this. This completely sets us back. But they did print it. And, uh you know, maybe you'll see some steam come out of this uh, this politically correct effort here, Craig. Crushing poverty might be a little more concerning than being offended, potentially, by the name of a, of a football team that, for the most part, is nowhere near where most of these people live. And the other thing, of course, is you do still do have the columnists who say, well, I'm, I'm still not going to use it. I'm, I'm a little troubled that so many people don't see why this is so offensive, <laughs> but I guess I'll have to... You know, Native Americans, you that. really should be more sensitive. <laughs> Why aren't you offended? Come yeah, on. Yeah, where are you? It's, it's kind of offends me that you're not offended. Uh, <laughs> it's like looking in a mirror that reflects into another mirror. It just never it, it, It's inception. It's like you go down one more layer into another layer of being offended. And then you get a little layer more offended by that. In fact, honestly, quite, quite literally now, Greg, you and I do find them kind of arrogant to tell Native Americans what to think. So we're offended that they're offended by the fact that Native Americans are not offended. Blah. Wow. Wrap that around your minds on a Monday. All right, on to the bad martini now, Jim. And I, I guess by all accounts, it was considered to be a pretty successful annual meeting in the National Rifle Association. The marquee news event, of course, was on Friday when presumptive Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump was endorsed by the NRA. He made a big deal out of the fact that he's the first candidate to receive that endorsement prior to the nominating convention. He then gave a speech, however, that uh, really didn't talk about guns very much. He talked about how Hillary wants to take away the Second Amendment, but that's part of his stump speech. He went on and talked about everything else like immigration and, and so many other things. He didn't really tailor his speech at all, except to say that he's absolutely within 20 minutes going to get rid of gun-free zones. So 
Not really sure that's how gun-free zones work. I'm not sure the president just decides where, when and where they, uh, they show up. But uh, kind of odd that he didn't uh, make the speech more centric to the crowd. Actually, Greg, it's not that odd. <laughs> it's Donald Trump. Not for him, I guess. Yeah, yeah I mean, he, you know, he remembers to mention a few things. He's got, you can tell there's like either a note card or a piece of paper with only like the most vague points. Remember, you're in Kentucky. Uh, remember you won Kentucky, mention that, brag about that, things like that. Um, I was there, Greg, and let me tell you, I've seen David Lynch films that are more straightforward and coherent and easy to follow than, uh, than, than Trump's remarks here. Um, you know, yes, it is. He was endorsed. I think it's a very, it is a very big deal that the NRA endorsed, uh, Trump before, technically before he's the nominee, although I think it's pretty clear that he's going to be the Republican nominee. Um, it's usually they, they endorse in the fall. I don't know if this is designed to send a quick reassuring signal to their membership. No, 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 this guy is okay. Uh, Trump says he's very pro second amendment now, but we know back in 2000 in one of his books, he said he supported the assault weapons ban and supported a slightly longer, um, waiting period for purchasing a gun. Even in this speech, Greg, there's a one point where he, he's not a member. But two of Trump's sons are members, and he says, oh, they're out, and they're hunting, they're great. They, they have so many guns, so many rifles. Sometimes it kind of worries me, but uh, which is generally not the kind of tone you take <laughs> at the National Rifle Association to indicate that some people have too many guns and that it worries you. Uh, I think polite silence is how I would uh, describe the crowd's reaction to that one. But I don't think I would say that there are a lot of gun owners who aren't going to support Donald Trump uh, because of his past, you know, indicate comments on this issue, or even his current, you know, tone deaf comments, because the option is Hillary Clinton and, and the speech by Chris Cox, the uh, executive director, and then Wayne LaPierre, the executive vice president, were really long and detailed about how terrible a Hillary Clinton presidency would be for gun owners, and in particular, the idea of her appointing a new Supreme, another Supreme Court justice. The Heller decision was five to four. There's an excellent chance if it came up to. Uh, the Supreme Court again. Uh, Ginsburg has indicated she wants another crack at this with a different court. It could go 5-4 the other way. And all of a sudden, the Second Amendment would not protect an individual right to bear arms. Uh, Ginsburg has said very explicitly she does not believe the Second Amendment guarantees a right for an individual person's right to own, an ar- own a firearm. Um, she says that she believes the Second Amendment is outdated and obsolete. Reassuring, you know, that, that the Supreme Court justice just decides one amendment that we don't need it anymore. And thus it doesn't, you know, affect her thinking at all. So in that light, the stakes being very high for gun owners, you can either pick the unreliable ally in Donald Trump or you could pick the certain foe in Hillary Clinton. And, you know, most gun owners, I think, are going to be pretty good. You know, they'll, they'll roll the dice. They'll take their chances with Donald because they know what they get with Hillary. And uh, the, the closing lines of uh, Wayne LaPierre's comment as he was introducing Trump was, you know, he, described, he spends like 10 minutes describing how bad things would be under Hillary Clinton. And he says, let me introduce someone who's going to give you a very different White House. Yes, it would be very different and, and probably better. But I noticed he didn't say, and here is a lifelong friend of the Second Amendment who's been there with us and fought in the trenches. Of that. Yeah. He couldn't because Trump hasn't been. And so um, Trump showed his, his typical coherence and uh, structure and organization in his remarks. Um, I think a lot of uh, gun owners are like, well, he's the best we got. I guess we'll go for it. And uh, that's not exactly the, the most cheery tone to take heading into a general election. It's got to be an odd time when the vast majority of voters, regardless of which one they're going to vote for, are going to go in there and say, well, it's not as bad as the other one. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> we're going to put it's, it's, it's going to replace e pluribus unum on our currency. <laughs> eh, better than the other one. Oh, man. All right. Well, on to the crazy martini now. And as we uh, discussed with uh, David French on uh, Friday, Mitt Romney has pretty much closed up shop on his effort to find another candidate to run against Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. He tried Ben Sass. He tried John Kasich. He tried a couple other people, General Mattis. And another name that uh, we talked about, Jim, uh, a few days ago was Mark Cuban. And you made the point that, wow, let's take on uh, in, uh, a guy with a big ego who's uh, known because of a reality show with a guy who's got a big ego and is a billionaire and is known for his reality show. But now Mark Cuban has basically let it be known that he's not uh, in a position to run for president because it's too too little time. But he would be willing to consider being vice president for Trump or Clinton And if the vote were to be held right now and he weren't on a ticket, he would vote for Clinton. So, uh, Jim, uh, I think when uh, when the uh, never Trump folks got to uh, Mark Cuban and considered him seriously, it meant that they were pretty much at the end of the list. One option is somebody who is asked whether he wants to run the Democratic ticket. (laughs) The Republican nominee is the guy who gave oodles of money to the Democrats. And oh, by the way, fun fact, Greg, last time the National Rifle Association met in Louisville, 
It was 2008, and uh, the man they endorsed was a registered member of the Democratic Party. All kinds of names are being thrown around as potential uh, Trump running mates. One of them is Jim Webb, the former Democratic senator. And of course, Hillary is, you know, the Democratic nominee and likely to pick, uh, you know, talk it was from Elizabeth Warren, Julian Castro, people like that. Greg, could we get a Republican running for president? <laughs> That'd be nice. Just a somebody who's been a lifelong Republican. Or the other great irony, of course, is it's conceivable libertarians this meeting this weekend could nominate Gary Johnson, who was governor of New Mexico, as a Republican. Yeah. And the other possibility is William Weld, the former governor of, of Massachusetts, as a Republican. So the Republicans have nominated a Democrat. <laughs> Hillary may pick the uh, – if you picked Cuban, and she wouldn't because then she'd basically say, hey, you know who I think is qualified to be president of the United States or a heartbeat away? The loudmouth billionaire who makes controversial statements and has a reality show. <laughs> so let's say she picked Cuban, so we'd get that. Uh, and then the only people with Republicans running would be the Libertarian ticket. That's, you know, <laughs> it's like they played musical chairs or something. and Everybody just switched around. And At the count of three, everybody get up. Democrats would nominate a Democrat, Republicans nominate a Republican, Libertarians nominate a Libertarian. We'll just do this all over again. Sound good? Yeah, and Republicans are wondering, hey, maybe this Johnson Weld ticket is the is is the way to go here. If we don't like Trump, forgetting that Weld was the guy that Republicans blocked from being ambassador to something in the late nineties. I think it was Mexico or yeah, so China. Jesse Howell was ambassador to Mexico under Bill Clinton, and some of it was his perspective on. Uh, gay rights and gay marriage and things like that under Jesse Helms. So it may not be quite the same issue it was, but uh, it's like it's like old timers day for <laughs> 90s Republican governors. It just never gets better. Jim, talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And be sure to tune in again on Tuesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.